On February 9, 2005, Hassan Rouhani gave a speech in Mashhad. Um, the speech was entitled, Iran's Measures Rob the Americans of Foresight. And in that speech to a collection of Islamic Republic elites, he outlined what he referred to as the doctrine of surprise. He said, for example, after giving a summary of the Islamic Republic's history up until that point in time, that he needed to emphasize that an important factor in the defeat of the plots of the enemies of Islam and the victory of the Islamic Revolution was the principle of surprise, was unpredictability. He continued, for example, um, to say with regard to previous bouts of nuclear negotiations, what has confused the Americans and it also made them quite angry is that the basis of our activity remains unpredictable for them. They thought we would take a harsh approach in the first phase and we would leave the, um, the international peace. Then they would be able to refer the case to the Security Council more easily. However, he then continues, we chose not to and in the end, the Europeans ended up augmenting trade with us. And so what he proposes throughout, not just on the nuclear negotiations, is sort of um, a feint and pivot in talking about diplomacy on one hand and perhaps acting once the Americans or the West or the Europeans or whatever his adversary is lets their guard down, fainting to the other side. And it seems that this is something which we consistently see in his behavior indeed. Back in 2008, when he was on the defensive, he was a retired official at the time, and he was giving an interview to the Iranian press against the backdrop of officials criticizing Rouhani for at one point suspending nuclear enrichment. He basically came out swinging at Ahmadinejad and Ahmadinejad's followers by saying, look, this was tactics. We needed to, we had, we had two goals. One was to separate the Europeans from the Americans. And the second was we needed to upgrade and add more centrifuges anyway, so we needed to take a pause. By agreeing to suspend nuclear enrichment, what we did was ensure that we could turn the switch back on again without any additional timeline being imposed from the outside. And indeed, that's just what they did. This was at a time when the Iranians were building the Fordo nuclear reactor, which, um, uh, sorry, the Fodor nuclear enrichment plant underneath the mountains near Qum, which has become such an issue. I mean, generally speaking, you don't need secrecy if your program is um, civilian in nature. Now, what we see time and time again are examples of Hassan Rouhani using diplomacy, if you will, almost as an asymmetric warfare strategy, and we fall for it repeatedly. It's the whole Albert Einstein adage, uh, insanity, the definition of insanity is doing the same action repeatedly but expecting different results. Now there's other issues going on here. We have the Yasser Arafat strategy which has been so effective against the United States in the past of saying one thing to American diplomats or the American media and quite another thing to the audience back home. So for example, and this doesn't just apply to Hassan Rouhani, one, the presidency in Iran, of course, is more about style than about substance. Never mind that people are now embracing Hassan Rouhani as if he speaks for the whole regime. But some people who are willing to give him the benefit of the doubt will say that Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader, in his speech in which he coined this idea of, quote unquote, heroic flexibility, that this signals that Rouhani has the supreme leader behind him once and for all and that therefore we can trust Rouhani in negotiations now even if we did not in the past. What's actually important is to see what's left out. When in Friday prayers, and you guys all know about the institution of Friday prayers, you can think of them almost as weekly State of the Union addresses uh, given by leaders who are handpicked by the supreme leader to give that message of the week. In explaining what heroic flexibility meant, the Friday prayer leaders in Mashhad, Isfahan, and elsewhere were quite clear in saying that heroic flexibility meant a shift in tactics, not a shift in policy. Indeed, we see this repeatedly. When Hassan Rouhani spoke, um, or his aides leaked word or, or, or whatever, to the New York Times, that perhaps the, the plant at Fordo, um, Fordo could be on the bargaining table, 
The New York Times picked that up and ran with it. They were cherry picking, however, because Ali Salahi, the head of Iran's atomic energy organization, on the sidelines of a cabinet meeting chaired with Rouhani, said the same day, which means in effect eight and a half hours before the New York Times went to press because of the time difference, that under no circumstances would Fordo ever be on the bargaining table, that that was just a lie. And yet New York Times runs with it and we use it as the basis for our belief that negotiations are indeed possible. We see this repeatedly. Hassan Rouhani, in, President Obama gave his press conference in which he talked about his telephone call with Hassan Rouhani and said this shows that we may have an agreement and we could actually come to an agreement within a year. I'll get back to that press conference in a second. What's interesting is he's not the, Obama isn't the only politician giving a press statement or a press conference. When Hassan Rouhani went back to Tehran, he likewise gave a press conference in which he said, under no circumstances is Iran's uranium enrichment going to be a subject for discussion at these negotiations. Therefore, again, we in the United States are guilty of cherry picking, of hearing or imagining what we want to hear and ignoring what the Iranians are actually saying to their own public. Now let's go back to President Obama's press conference because this leads to another common misunderstanding which has been bantered about in the press and it should really be nipped in the bud. It's the idea of um, that negotiations can be based on the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei's fatwa banning the use and the construction and the possession of nuclear weapons. Let's take a look at this fatwa. Now, there's no such thing as a secret fatwa. The whole idea of a fatwa <laughs> is that someone asks a question and they will get a religious answer to it, which you can, if you look at the Supreme Leader as your source of emulation, he is providing that sort of guidance. And when you look at his webpage, uh, both in English, but it's more up to date in, on the Persian version of, um, I guess it's Khamenei.ir. There is a list of fatwas. Everything, for example, if your car runs over an animal in the street, is, and that animal has been killed in an unhalal way by being run over by a car, does that mean that whatever your tires touch your tires are unclean, whatever they touch are unclean, and you have a whole religious answer to that about whether the robe was wet, about how long the tires have been used, and so forth. If you can put minor things like that on such websites, you'd imagine that you could actually put the text of this nuclear fatwa, but it's not there. And what's actually more interesting, when you put and record what Iranians have said about their own nuclear fatwa, this fatwa to which President Obama referred as a basis of negotiations, you have a situation in which Iranian officials have quoted it in different ways, in different times, in, in mutually inconsistent ways. It seems that the text of this fatwa is constantly evolving, so too is the date of issue. Sometimes it's referred to as having been uttered in 2004, sometimes in 2005, sometimes in 2012. But the, ba the, the point of this is any politician and any official who says that Iran has issued this fatwa should be challenged right then and there to produce the text of the fatwa, and to produce the text of the fatwa signed by the Supreme Leader. Having one version of the text that may be on the Iran's UN missions website doesn't really count if you have Iranian officials quoting another version from 2004, 2005. And, and the idea that we would base our diplomacy and our national security on a myth is truly astounding. But let's say for the, take for the fact that maybe there is a fatwa there. Here it comes back, let's go back to Hassan Rouhani. There's been a lot of discussion about whether Hassan Rouhani had a PhD, whether he truly graduated from this small university in Glasgow or not, uh, when he ever got the time to write the PhD, but no one ever talks about the nature of his PhD dissertation. His PhD dissertation was about how nothing, um, basically how no fatwa, how nothing in Islamic law is unchangeable. Now, you can look towards the positive in that, saying Iran can change its approach to the world. But on the other hand, if you're basing your diplomacy on the idea that this fatwa bans nuclear weapons, but at the same time, you have a president who's written his PhD dissertation on the fact that nothing in a fatwa can't be changed, 
then it seems rather silly to base your diplomacy on this idea of a fatwa. And so in any number of senses, we have a situation in which the Iranians seem to be playing us, hook, line, and sinker. Now, we could go back to the basics, and I'll, I'll conclude with two points. Number one, why is it? Two points with multiple subpoints. You know how academics are. <laughs> why is it that the United States doesn't believe that Iran only wants its nuclear program for civilian aims? There's multiple reasons why we tend to doubt them. Number one, they say they want a completely indigenous energy supply for their domestic energy capability. Well, when you look at their natural reserves of uranium, and they do have uranium there, and you calculate, and some, some folks at RAND have done this, um, not on RAND's dime, however. You calculate how much low enriched uranium fuel Iran would, could produce from its natural uranium reserves. You get that they could produce enough reactor fuel, basically, to fuel eight nuclear reactors, which is what they say they want for 15 years. Well, if you're considering the fact that for one third of their investment, they could upgrade their refinery and pipeline network and fuel their country on, on gasoline um, and oil for a couple centuries. This is a calculation which doesn't really make sense. Number two, the Iranians will, I mean, when it comes to the roots of our suspicion about what, what Iran is actually doing, this is completely different from the Iraq situation, which was based on faulty intelligence. The faulty intelligence, of course, was based on the fact that Saddam Hussein had lied to his own people. And so when you were either dealing with human intelligence or SIGINT, you were getting people that truly believed what they were saying because they had been convinced of that by, by Saddam Hussein himself. It's not the same situation in, Iraq, uh, in Iran. When it comes to Iran, the root of the suspicion with regard to Iran's program and its noncompliance with its nuclear nonproliferation uh, treaty safeguards agreement is the fact that they have had inspections from the IAE and they have been caught in lies repeatedly. For example, they have said that their program is completely indigenous, they're doing everything themselves, but when IAEA inspectors find, for example, traces of uranium, metal, or plutonium and go back to Iran for an explanation, they will say, oh, that's contamination from a part we got from Pakistan. Well, just six months ago, you said it was completely indigenous in nature, and if you go to the IAEA.org website, and they have a whole section on Iran, and just read the summaries of the reports, the reports are basically compendiums of lies and explanations for those lies and new lies and explanations for those new lies. We're also suspicious with regard to what the Iranians have done with the uh, additional protocol to the non-proliferation treaty, which as you guys remember uh, was implemented in I believe it was 1995 after Iraq under Saddam Hussein had gotten 13 clean bills of health from the IAEA only to find out after Operation Desert Storm that they did indeed have a nuclear program. Well, what it basically did was tighten up the inspections, but as, as the sweetener, you also got expanded nuclear enrichment, um, nuclear technology sharing. What devil's in the details and lawyers can be careless. When you sign the agreement, you get the sweetener, and then when you ratify it, you get the additional inspections. Well, what Iran did was, of course, sign but not ratify. So what they want to say and what they do say is, legally, this is our right to take this enrichment. Uh, th this additional technology, and you can't prevent us from having it. But they refuse to have the instant inspections, which really are needed. Now, the other point, that was point one, subset A, B, and C. <laughs> the other point, which is much um, shorter and briefer, is the hypocrisy of the Obama administration when it comes to international organizations and its disdain for unilateralism. Over the course of the Bush administration and also the beginning of the Obama administration, thanks mostly to um, pressure from the Senate, you have a situation in which there are, I mean, there's multiple UN Security Council resolutions, but the ones which really impose sanctions, I think three or four of them, unanimous or near unanimous. And what they say in no, I mean, in very clear terms is that Iran needs to suspend uranium enrichment. That wasn't meant as the opening position for negotiations. That is what the United Nations said, United Nations Security Council said unanimously. 
after multiple instances of Iran getting caught cheated after the IAEA Board of Governors had referred the Iran situation to the United Nations. And in that situation, what Obama in effect is doing is saying, with the wave of my hand, because I'm a very important person and I love myself deeply and I, and I give a great speech, is that I can completely overrule what the United Nations has said and say that, all, that Iran can enrich, that this is justified. I personally can change the United States position in the most unilateral way, a unilateralism which never even existed when it came to George W. Bush or Ronald Reagan or any of the others who many on the left or among progressives like to bash for their supposed hostility to international law. And there we have, I mean, an unfortunate situation. The last very brief point I'll make, by the way, is also something from the Iranian press which Hassan Rouhani mentioned on his first um, on his first press conference as president. It was that the statistics center of Iran had released statistics that had shown that the Iranian economy over the past year, the Iranian year going from March 2011 to, um, I'm sorry, from March 2012 to March 2013, the Iranian economy had contracted 5.4 percent. Now that means that there is tremendous economic pressure on Iran, both because of sanctions and also because of Iran's own economic mismanagement. But the very fact that we have this um, horse and pony show right now is likely because Iran's goal isn't to come to peace and reach agreement when it comes to its nuclear program, but rather to relieve pressure on its economy. And the question is whether the Obama administration is in or under the guise of giving, of um, enabling diplomacy, is going to before talks even begin, give the, Rohan, give the Islamic Republic what it actually wants from these talks in the first place, which, isn't, which doesn't have anything to do with the nuclear program and has everything to do with lifting the sanctions, which finally have started to have a bite inside Iran. And with that, I open the floor to questions. Thanks. Michael, thank you very much. <clears throat> one, one of the things that um, I think you sort of alluded to, but that it's worth emphasizing is that I believe even recently Rouhani boasted on Iranian television that he had actually bought time for the Iranian program back at an earlier point by mm -hmm. this kind of, you know, flexibility and uh, negotiating yes. strategy and so on. So this, I mean, we are on notice. And <clears throat> I just would draw you out on the, you know, knowing the culture, knowing the characters that we're dealing with. What is the inevitable response to behavior like that we're engaging in when they get, are able to <coughs> perpetrate what amounts to kind of a serial fraud like this? Well, uh, two points. Um, first of all, the Iranians like to brag that they play chess while the Americans play checkers. In this case, it gets even worse because they've, they've literally published their game plan and we're simply choosing to ignore it. Um, Rohani, I mean, the important thing to remember about Iran's nuclear program, however you divide the factions up, um, I'll just generally divide them in three. The hardliners are the principalists like Ahmadinejad, like to brag that they are responsible and deserve credit for the nuclear program. The pragmatists, uh, with quotes around it, led by Ross and Johnny, like to brag that no, they are the ones who are responsible to the, for the success of the nuclear program. And the reformers, like Khatami and like Rouhani, like to brag that no, they are the ones that deserve the credit for the fact that Iran's nuclear program is as advanced as it is today. Um, one quick advertisement. My, my book, um, Dancing with the Devil, The Perils of it, um, Engagement, um, is a history of American diplomacy with rogue regimes and terrorist groups. It will be published on February 18th by Encounter of this, um, this year. Next year. Uh, next year, just in a couple months. Um, I'm sorry? Exactly. Within the same Iranian year. The point of this is, in looking at how the Iranians consider their own strategy and so forth, um, I've actually found quotes where the Iranians will say, um, and this is loose, I don't remember the exact quote, but this sort of strategy has worked for the North Koreans, so why shouldn't it work for us? I mean, the idea that rogues don't learn from each other. And by the way, in the book I define rogues, I accept Anthony, Tony Lake's definition of rogues. It's not 
And it's not a partisan book. It's not a polemic because, unfortunately, many Republican administrations have been just as bad about dealing with rogue regimes as Democratic administrations have been. But the point of the matter is we've got to stop reading sincerity into our engagement partners because there's many different reasons why different people will come to the negotiating table. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. So the Weekly Standard had a good editorial this week um, about Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech praising it and discussing uh, sort of how Syria, the Syria debacle has impacted uh, Iranian calculations. And maybe this is an obvious question, but yeah. can you just sort of talk a little bit about that, how that's how our actions there have been bold and well, this brings back to the point of Frank's question, which I forgot to answer. <coughs> what do the Iranians think when they see all this? Ali um, Fadavi, who's the head of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy, gave a speech a couple years ago and said, the American military is in retreat in a way it hasn't been uh, for more than 200 years. That's an indication of how they are looking at it. When it comes to Syria, it's not so much <coughs> that the Iranians are overconfident, it's the fact that most of our allies simply don't trust us anymore, and that's something that's going to be impossible to get back. And if you combine the Syria deal with <coughs> this new romance or bromance um, with Iran and the pivot to Asia uh, speech that President Obama gave a while ago, what every single Gulf leader, flag officer, or major political leader thinks of in the lifetime of their own experience is Harold, um, was it Harold McMillan's East of Suez speech uh, given in 1968 presaging the very rapid withdrawal of the British from the Gulf in 1970. Now remember, I mean on the positive, that's when we got the, um, our base in Bahrain, naval support activity, but at the same time that's when Iran took um, the islands from Sharjah, one of the United Arab Emirates, the um, um, <coughs> um, Abu Musa and the greater and lesser tombs. Now granted, he, they did it, the Shah did it with a nod and a wing from President Nixon. It's part of the Nixon doctrine. But <coughs> the fact of the matter is, thanks, people feel that we are in retreat wholesale and that's not the way to um, support allies. Yeah. Or our interests. Dan? So when it comes to your fellow pundits on this issue, I'm seeing they all know all the facts you just gave forward, just like people at CNN know how to translate Farsi. <laughs> and yet they're purposely downplaying the importance of these facts, especially by these direct quotes. Is there a, any other way to interpret that than that they're trying to hoodwink us, your fellow pundits who are experts on Iran, um, who are of the opposite political persuasion, seem to be purposely lying to us in order to get their policy recommendations. So, am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Um, first of all, not many people are basing their facts on what is published in the open sources in the West, and that's only half the story. So it, some people may sincerely believe that he is much more, um, that Rouhani is much more sincere than perhaps the Persian language press would have it seem. And when it comes to Christian Amanpour, just let me defend her. Just because you're a native speaker doesn't mean you, you know the language. Um, but no, I mean, what, what's often happened is, um, and this is the case in area studies, not just in Iranian studies where my background is, that over the last couple decades, there's been this assumption that if you study an area, you need to advocate for it. And it's one of those basic principles which I've always rejected. I mean, I can love Iranian culture, and I do. And I can have greatly enjoyed my time when I lived in Iran uh, during the 1990s. But that doesn't mean that I should ever feel that I need to advocate for a regime like that. Um, and one of the major problems <coughs> that I think the younger generation of um, Iranian Americans have is especially, I mean, something you hear from their parents is too often the younger generation has been willing to conflate the Islamic Republic with Iranian nationalism um, and their fear f for fear that <coughs> any targeting of the Islamic Republic is really targeting of Iran. 
another way to look at this, and I'm putting, I'm really putting on my nerd cap here. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a historian by training, which means I get paid to predict the past. Usually, get it right about 50 percent of the time. But one of the problems with Iranian studies is that most of the books of Iranian history that are still used, for example, in the FBI and the CIA and so forth. Um, in universities when people learn about Iran were commissioned in 1979 and published in 1980 and 1981, um, Irvand Abrahami and Nikki Keddy and so forth, at a time when basically the publishers went out, and you know all this because we've seen it again with the Arab Spring, and said, hey, look, explain how this Islamic revolution caught everyone by surprise. And all the academics wrote about how, oh, we should have seen the signs coming in it. And it's the natural outcome of Iranian political evolution. I would argue that no, it's an anomaly. And it was almost accidental that it happened. It was a perfect storm. But that doesn't mean it should be permanent. However, if you've based all your knowledge on the first um, idea that this is just the natural outcome of Iranian political evolution, then you don't have in your mind that some of our policies, far from helping the Iranian people, might be throwing a lifeline to a failing regime. Oh, sorry. Do no. you think the Obama administration is likely to unilaterally dismantle sanctions in U.S. law passed by the Senate side and the House side of the President? Um, I mean, first of all, we have the issue of waivers. Yeah. And second of all, we have the issue that, um, bluntly, we don't have Jesse Helms anymore. Um, it seems one, one of the things that always frustrated me, and I'm sure it frustrated many people on the Hill, that President Obama gave credit for the effectiveness of his sanctions, never mind that he had opposed the sanctions that the Senate had approved 100 to zero. Yeah. The important thing to recognize, however, is that the Senate needs to stand up to the White House. They are the ones who have been guiding successful Iran strategy, not the President. And at the very least, a little good cop, bad cop won't hurt the American position in negotiations. Uh, Claire, Claire, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, is anyone giving any thought to, to the just parade of new revelations about new sites in, in uh, the Iranian nuclear uh, program, Kondab, and, 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 the, and the place that they call Quds, where all the missile uh, uh, emplacements are? And especially because the IAEA actually accepts written questionnaires from the Iranians about their sites, for instance, Fordow which hasn't been visited by the IAE since last December. And instead, they take written questionnaires from the Iranians about the status of what's going on there and put that into their report, the governor's you know, periodic report. Is anybody looking at this from, from that perspective? Um, short answer is no, but just to add on to some of the, um, the problems which you rightly identify. Um, first of all, the IAEA, the devil's always in the details with the or international organizations. Their charter, charter only allows them to inspect locations which are declared. So if there's a suspicion of a secret negotiation, if with satellites we've seen it and know what exactly it is, um, if we see trucks that are marked uranium going into tunnels and coming out empty, we are not, the IAEA is not allowed to inspect those unless Iran formally declares that they are nuclear sites. Um, I mean, one of the ironies of Mohammed al-Baradai's temper tantrum after Israel attacked the Syrian nuclear site in 2007, um, when he said that the Israelis should have given the evidence to the IAEA, is that the IAEA had no power to inspect that site, even if the Israelis had. They only had power to alert the Syrians that the Israelis knew about the site. Um, the other issue which people forget is when it comes to remote monitoring. Most people assume that there's some guy who's sitting in front of a TV screen watching that, <coughs> that nuclear site 24 hours a day or eight hours a day in shifts, whatever. In reality, that's not the way remote monitoring works. You have a videotape which is set up and the, the monitoring goes to the videotape. Then every month or so, someone from the IAEA will go to Tehran pick up the videotape, take it back, put it in his VCR. And so one of the questions for policymakers has to be, um, given the delay in actually monitoring those sites, how quickly could Iran reconfigure 
and achieved, let's say, 20 kilograms of highly enriched uranium. If you have a configuration where they can do it within 17 days or so, then that means that they can effectively break out without the IAEA, IAEA knowing about it ahead of time. And Which Florida doesn't even have cameras. It's in my next op-ed piece, which has a few covered all the areas you mentioned. But I also propose you've got to change the dynamics of the negotiation. And I want our illustrious leader to make an announcement that he's going to reinitiate re the robust nuclear earth penetrant. With, with the whole concept being that you're telling Iran all your tunneling is for naught, because right. you can get it. Uh, and the same message is sent to North Korea, to China, and so on. Now, whether this will, I don't know, if, I wanted it out today. I, I think it will run Monday, but I'm not sure. But I wanted it out before they sent out next week. Okay. <coughs> um, well, from your lips to God's ears, Admiral, is all I can say. It'd be wonderful. All right, our part is written by Amos Milani of the Shah. Mm -hmm. How big a role did the vying uh, for influence by the British, us, and the Russians play, play you know, coming forward? That could, it seemed like uh, the Iran was a, like a tennis court and people, you know, people were trying to, you know, you know our, us, the Russians, and the British were all vying for influence and trying to influence the uh, Internal politics. I mean, certain, certainly that's the case. Um, and if you want to draw it back in history, you had the Belgians, the Austrians, and the French doing it as well. Um, but here's another irony as we go forward. I mean, Rouhani actually said the United States should actually pay compensation for the 1950, um, 1953 coup against Mohammed Mossadegh. The irony here and the irony of Ma Madeleine Albright's apology back in 2000 for it is um, Mossadegh was a Democrat in the way that Jean Bertrand, um, Jean Bertrand Aristide in Haiti was a Democrat. He's a Democrat that didn't mind um, mob violence and where his opponents would be burned alive. Um, the fact of the matter is we can debate the coup in the context of the Cold War, but what we can't debate is our co-conspirators, and this was outlined in the Shah's autobiography, um, chapter the red versus the black, uh, the red being the communists, the black being the turbans. Um, is the fact that the clerics were our allies in the 1953 coup. And so, in effect, when we are self-flagellating to the extent where we want to apologize for the 1953 coup and perhaps even pay compensation, we're talking about doing that to our co-conspirators mm -hmm. rather than um, really Mossadegh, who may not have been a communist but was naive enough to have Iran collapse into that camp, should he have continued with his populism. Fascinating. Okay, let me put it this way. Um, the, the basic idea of the 12th Imam um, is that in traditional Shiite theology, you have the hidden Imam, Muhammad al-Mahdi, who went into occultation. At the end of days, he's going to come back with Jesus Christ at his side to usher in a period of just and corrupt um, Islamic government on earth. And so traditionally, you have a division among the Shiites, um, the majority of whom feel, well, until the Mahdi, the, this messianic figure comes back, there is... Um, by definition, all government is corrupt, and therefore, we shouldn't be involved in government. I mean, the traditional ayatollahs, like some of those in Nedjev, can be seen almost like Supreme Court judges, where they will intercede if something's clearly un-Islamic, but they don't want to actually have the formal reins of government power. Um, and then you have Khomeini, uh, Khomeini, who revived this idea of the guardianship of the Joris, as it's called. And basically, the root of that philosophy was Muhammad didn't separate um, mosque and state, and therefore there's no reason why we need to, and he came up with an elaborate theology which said, we clerics can act as the, um, uh, the, um, the deputies of the Messiah on earth. Now where it comes into policy is this idea that Ahmadinejad and perhaps some others put forward that what you have is a situation where you can hasten the return of the hidden imam, perhaps through violence, perhaps through war. Now, there's also a cynical political issue going on there, because when you read the Shiite theology, when the Messiah comes back, who's going to be, who are going to be the people that oppose his recognition as Messiah? It's going to be the clerics. 
and so forth. When you have a situation where Ahmadinejad is citing this desire to bring the hidden imam back, what you have is making, I won't say Hail Mary, a Hail Mahdi pass <laughs> over the heads of the clergy and saying to the ordinary Iranian people, what I'm trying to do is bring back this just, incorrupt, and Islamic government. And just like the holy books say, the Rafsanjanis, the Khatamis, all of them are getting in the way. Now, here's where we should be concerned from a policy perspective. As much in politics as we talk about um, political factions, reformers, hardliners, pragmatists, what have you, we don't, it's important when we look at Iran not only to recognize what we know, but what, also what we don't know. And what our intelligence community doesn't have clarity on is a factional breakdown within the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Now, the Rand Corporation, um, I think Frank Wavery a couple years ago, did a book in which he speculated about what factions there might be. But we know that the IRGC isn't a monolith. But we don't know that this general <coughs> believes this, that general believes that. And this comes down to the point from a policy perspective that if Iran develops a nuclear arsenal, I would guess that the most loyal factions of the IRGC are going to have the command, control, and custody of it. But what we don't know is what the mentality and the belief of the person who have their fingers on the buttons are. And that's where the Mahdi philosophy issue should come and be a concern to the United States. Can I just, clarification, did I understand you to say that Khatami does not subscribe? to this ideology, that it was uh, Ahmadinejad and... Uh, and Ahmadinejad Clark. is the one that popularized it. Who knows what Khatami truly believes? The fact of the matter is, and we could argue about this offhand, but what I would say the larger point is that when it comes to some of these issues of um, theological interpretation, we simply don't know what some of the people believe. Now, with regard to the clergy, I'm a little bit less worried about some of the traditional clergy than I am um, even if they subscribe to the Islamic Re Republic and this concept of the guardianship of the Juris, then I am about the Revolutionary Guard. Mm -hmm. Simply because it's one thing for a cleric to say something, but the Revolutionary Guard, they are more likely to have the means to be able to act upon it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. What did you make of the Supreme Leader throwing cold water on the uh, phone call between Rouhani and Obama, saying that, well, Obama can't be trusted because he's under control designers, which is news to both of them, I'm sure. <laughs> um, was that just domestic politics? Or? Well, first of all, I think we have to take domestic <coughs> politics seriously, and it's not politics in our case. I mean, we shouldn't allow domestic politics to be an excuse when they shape the domestic politics, and they have the ability to do it. But also, I mean, one of the themes, again, in advertisement... They meaning the Iranians? They or? being the Iranians, or any autocratic regime. Um, I mean, we shouldn't allow... For example, if we go back to Yasser Arafat, Yasser Arafat would throw up his arms and say, I can't make this concession. My people would never stand it, never mentioning that for the past 10 years they've been bombarded by incitement, which Yasser Arafat had designed. Now, when it comes to, um, I just completely had a senior moment. The, 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 uh, the Ayatollah poo pooing the, uh, phone call. Oh, the, uh, the phone call. Yeah. One of the themes in my book is that nothing we're seeing now we haven't seen before. And there's been at least three examples where there has been this, I mean, real belief in recent history that we were on the verge of a breakthrough with Iran. Um, and, you know, in the Islamic world, a thousand years ago is as if it happened, it's flash in the pan as if it happened yesterday, but moved 10 miles away and it's as if you're moving the ends of the earth. In America, 10 years ago is ancient history, but we don't blink an eye at moving a thousand miles away. In this case, you have uh, 1989 when President H.W. Bush was inaugurated, he gave a speech that was remarkably similar in his inauguration address in parts to what President Obama gave with the outstretched hands. Only Bush had talked about um, bygones can be bygones. We don't need to um, allow the cycle of enmity to continue forever. And this was interpreted in Iran as a genuine desire to reach out. Khomeini died on June 4th, 1989, there was a heat wave going on. The quip on the street in Tehran at the time was the old man was so senile, he forgot to close the door on the way down. And <laughs> at any rate, you had Khamenei, who all the Iran experts said was a pragmatist and a moderate. Um, and then you had Rafsanjani be elected. The Iran-Iraq war was over. So there was this real belief, a new beginning. This 10-year nightmare was over. And it got to the point that um, I believe it was Skullcroft asked the United Nations Secretary General to send someone to Rafsanjani to see whether he was serious. And what Rafsanjani said to um, Gio 
Macondo Pico, a, a UN func um, an Italian functionary at the UN, was um, no, that was rhetoric. I, I mean, that was rhetoric for rhetoric's sake. I'm not able to make this change. Now, fast forward to the year 2000. You had a remarkably similar situation at the United Nations where there was this belief that Kamal Kharazi, the Iranian foreign minister, and Madeleine Albright could actually meet and shake hands and talk one on one. And it was, the whole mechanism was going to be on the sidelines of the six plus two talks with regard to Afghanistan, if you guys remember them, before 9 11, and that all the other delegates were going to be late. So it was just going to be Madeleine Albright waiting there, Kamal Kharazi was going to come in, and they would have the opportunity to talk one on one. It was a whole elaborate stage managed affair, and at the very end, Khamenei called uh, Kharazi and basically told him not to do it. And so Madeleine Albright was left there twiddling her thumbs. And it's an embarrassment. But the fact of the matter is, we've seen this situation before. I mean, we simply don't learn from our past. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> In the last 12 months, have we actually supplied Israel, as we promised, with bunker bus and bombs, or the upgraded bunker bus and bombs will actually have the de devastating I don't effect? Know. Do we know if Israel has uh, refueling aircraft, which they would need to be able to go to? Well, the Israelis the have been making a point over the last mm -hmm. couple of days of demonstrating that they can refuel F-15s and F-16s. Oh, nice. Let me, um, let me correct the presumption of the first part of it. The United States has not promised to give Israel to bunker mm -hmm. bus and bombs. In fact, the United States aircraft that deliver those weapons are not in the Israeli inventory anywhere. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the kind of weapons that the Admiral was talking about, um, uh, Israel is a whole step below those, and there's no prospect yeah. of Israel getting those weapons, even, even if it's just not the same. But the bunker bombing, busting bombs that you were talking about are not the ones that no. anybody's no. talking about no. for Israel. These, these are nuclear bombs. Yeah. The Israelis are actually running an exercise over Greece with long range. Nice. And with the cooperation video. of the Greeks. Yeah. Right. And is anyone buying the whole, they started sites from scratch and then covered it with gigantic amount of mounds of, of dirt and earth and saying that's for, you know, peaceful purposes for neutral, for I mean, it's one of the biggest okay. things. But this goes back to the whole 2003, um, sorry, 2007 National Intelligence Estimate where with a wave of a magic wand, we were able to change the definitions of what covert nuclear enrichment was all right. about. Therefore, it's no longer part of a military program. Having said that you specialize in predicting history, yeah. um, can you share with us what your crystal ball might tell you about <clears throat> how this plays out in the next few months? Do, we, do you anticipate that sanctions will be eased? Do you anticipate that the Iranians will I think some finally sanctions get will their hands on sufficient I think what we're heading to is a North Korea situation um, where we will, f I mean, the end goal of our discussion, I mean, again, one of the common phenomena of negotiating with rogue regimes, especially over time, is we lose sight of the forest through the trees and suddenly the process becomes the goal rather than the solution. Therefore, the victory is coming to talks, coming to the table, rather than having Iran stop its uranium enrichment. That's what happened in the North Korea situation itself, and I was able to document that many times. Um, therefore, we look at what happened with North Korea. Um, the frustration, and again, we're not here talking about North Korea this time, um, but in some of the interviews with Clinton administration officials ahead of the book, one of the things which they said with regard to the agreed framework was everyone at the time knew it was a bad agreement but they had looked around the world and they'd seen communist countries falling one after the other and they figured that they wouldn't need to ever fulfill that promise to give the two, light, um, the two nuclear reactors within 10 years because they figured North Korea wouldn't exist in 10 years with that regime and unfortunately it still did. Now the irony here is not only would it be a bad agreement but the Obama administration actually believes this regime is, has staying power so what is motivating them is beyond me. <laughs>